everyone, and welcome to another edition of The Cameron Files, aired exclusively right here on your KGRARadio.com every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern. Tonight, Grant is about to leave out for another big event this weekend, and he's got a very special guest that's going to be joining him at that event. And so we're going to waive the information and the updates and everything that Grant usually does, and I'm going to go ahead and introduce Grant to all of you. Thank you all once again for joining us, and now it's my honor to give you Grant Cameron. Good evening. Uh, Thank you to everybody who's taken time to listen to tonight's show. I've got a fantastic guest tonight. Uh, He will be joining me at uh, a conference on June the 30th of this uh, month uh, called The Architects of the New Paradigm, Living in a Post-Disclosure World, Humanity Awakens to the ET Presence. And it's going to be occurring in Vancouver, Canada, which is known in Canada as God's Country, very beautiful place. And my guest uh, will be joining myself, Richard Dolan, Danny Sheehan, Victor Vigiani, uh, George Norrie, and Tom Danheiser. And my guest tonight is uh, Johnny Enoch, who uh, is a clinical hypnotherapist, lecturer, and a writer, and actually lives in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, Not only has he been researching uh, extraterrestrial phenomena and exoteric subjects for over 20 years, but after witnessing a series of unexplainable events, which we'll get into while growing up, his search for answers has led him on adventures all around the world. Currently, he is a featured speaker on the Ancient Mysteries Tour of Egypt and the Serpentine Mystery Tour of Peru and Bolivia, with Brian Forrester. He is also writing a book on advanced civilization and ancient consciousness technologies. So I would like to welcome Johnny to the show. Thanks for taking time from your valuable life to uh, come and share with me and my listeners. Well, thanks for having me on, Grant. It's uh, a real pleasure to be here. Yeah, Johnny. Uh, One one of the things I sort of forgot to add is you and I both have a friend um, who runs a a radio network here in Canada, uh, Dave Scott, and he actually sort of introduced you on your last visit with him as um, asking you what kind of coffee you drank. And and I love that because I always get asked that quite often, too, about, you know, how I get so hyped up. And so you and I are in the same category of uh, being into the thing and wanting to go. So thank you, Johnny Enoch, for uh, being here. And let's get to the the um, the conference, June the 30th. Um, what I'd like to do first is I'd like to ask you what you're going to be talking about at the conference. And then I've got, uh, because you have so much material, we're going to do like a Jeopardy show here. And I'm going to go question after question after question, because you do a lot of stuff that I'm very interested in. So first of all, uh, sort of explain uh, your lecture that you'll be giving June the 30th in Vancouver, Canada. Well, thanks for asking, Grant. And first of all, I want to say that I am a huge fan of your work. You've inspired me so much over the years. I mean, look at the incredible works that you put out with UFOs, Area 51, and government informants, uh, you know, delving into these subjects. And much like my experiences that have inspired me and put me on this path, I know you had your own sightings and your own experiences that greatly inspired you. But with the topics I'll be discussing at our upcoming conference, I'm going to go into a completely different area when we open up this this topic, because I'm a guy that's always looking at the ancient mysteries. I'm, I'm fascinated by our religions, comparative religion, looking at our symbolism and delving into the mysteries. And I've gone all around the world investigating these subjects, crawling on my hands and knees underneath these temples and crypts, looking, you know, inside the pyramids for clues for, you know, lost ancient civilizations, advanced machining, and and talking to people in these fields of archaeolinguistics and anthropology and seeing, do we have the missing puzzle pieces somewhere? And so what I believe I've found, Grant, are some fascinating clues, not only in our ancient texts, you know, we, we learn about all kinds of in, incredible things like vimanas, 
are, are flying machines. But I believe I've found evidence for giants, even in Egypt. And, you know, that's some of the things I'm going to be bringing out, you know, and how that relates to, let's say, you know, our biblical texts or our Vedantic writings or saying, okay, is there a greater story here that we've been visited all along? And I tend to think so. So we're, we're going to go into that, and I'm going to kind of bring it up into the modern and, and say, okay, do we have a link here to our theoretical physics? Do we have a, another aspect of this within human consciousness? And, and the other idea is, is that where does that take us next? Because I believe that Knowledge is useless without wisdom. If we don't know how to apply this information, if we can't take all this information, this fascinating research that you've been doing for years and years, Grant, and, and then uh, I've been looking at and we've all been looking at, if we don't know where that's taking us next, uh, I think we have a problem. So I think that's where we got to go next with this and say, what, what are the exciting implications for humanity with this information? Okay, related to this, um, I saw some of your videos and you get into something that has sort of been brought up in ufology. Jacques Vallée brought this up and uh, Diane Pasolka yes. has also brought this up about how ancient sightings tie into the modern UFO world. So what about you? You were doing fairies and stuff like that with Ireland. How does all this stuff relate? Is, is there a connection between the alien, the alien ET stuff of today and figures that may have been reported, say, in Ireland or whatever in years gone by? I tend to think so. I'm a guy that believes that very much because when I've been into Ireland, uh, first of all, when I went there, uh, you know, I've been all over the UK looking for looking for different kinds of clues, uh, you know, going into uh, all over the, the mysteries of looking at Stonehenge and uh, the various mythologies involving castles and druids and uh, and everything like that. But I wanted to go specifically into Ireland and look at the topic of fairies, because we've heard so many incredible stories, even in Wales and other places, the story of Llewellyn and Rhys, uh, you know, stories of, of guys that go wandering into uh, a fairy circle, a fairy ring, which is very from it's very similar to what we have described as a crop circle. And, you know, that that pattern seems to be. Uh, very important, the circuitous pattern that we find there, uh, because it would it almost relates to what we would see like a wormhole uh, or bending time and space, you know, like uh, this this pattern. So uh, I started to see that we had some similar things there, like missing time that we find with our uh, abduction stories and our ET contactees. We started to see, you know, all sorts of incredible uh, experiences that people were reported seeing these beings appear and disappear. Uh, I mean, it's very mysterious. So again, I went to Ireland, I, I rented a car and I said, I'm going to drive around the whole island from top to bottom. I'm going to go to every town. And, you know, some people didn't want to come on camera, but I said, for those that do want to come on camera, I had the camera there ready to go. I was taking notes and I went to every pub and every area. And I said, do you believe in fairies? And I wanted to go and I wanted to find as much evidence as possible. So I went into, you know, the, the little towns and I found the Shanakis of the storytellers. And so at first I started getting a little bit of a pushback in big places like Dublin. In Dublin, the taxi driver told me, well, if you want to see a leprechaun, all you have to do is drink 12 pints of Guinness. And so at first <laughs> I said, you know, I understood he kind of was laughing a little bit in the big city. Um, but, you know, I found some modern storytellers and they would say, OK, well, maybe these these folks were just personifications of problems in Ireland, like, you know, during the Irish, you know, famine and, and different issues like that from a Jungian perspective, they were taking a more scientific or psychological approach. But the deeper I got into the country, the, the more I went, uh, I got very lucky and I found folks like this, this gentleman named Sean Ryan, uh, who lives at Leap Castle. And it was just the most incredible day. And there's a video online of me talking to him. And he lived in a 700 year old castle uh, by himself. And it was raining outside. And there was a little fireplace going in the background with it crackling. And he took me and he says, he was dead serious, looked me in the eyes. And he says, he says, fairies are real. These beings are real. And 
I, I know where they are. I know where they exist, but I can't show you on camera where they exist, but I can show you off of camera. And he goes, I'll even play you a song on this this little uh, flute that he had and whistle that he was playing songs that the king of the fairies taught him and all these people taught him. So I met people like that that were very interesting, and they told me that they don't mess with these fairy rings or fairy circles, and they have missing time and adventures into other places. And he said that these beings come from the heavens. He says they fell to earth in their 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 various uh, stories. So I do think think that there's a connection possibly where where these you know survivors of some sort of great migration where they uh, cosmic refugees that came here uh, were they part of the civilizations that had to go subterranean during the great cataclysmic events on earth I don't know, but uh, they do believe they exist and a lot of people over there take them very seriously I found many people saying that grant yeah wonderful um, you probably are familiar you may not want to go on this subject but you are familiar with the controversy right now about the atacama being um and also the nazca beings uh you worked on elongated skulls you worked on giants uh what's your take on are we the only species on earth oh no i i, I believe that you know this story about where we come from is very ancient. First of all, I believe that humanity is a hybrid species. So, you know, what we have today is that we we are a real mix in a match. If you go back to the uh, epic of Gilgamesh or you go back to these ancient stories, uh, we, we know even, you know, from the evidence that we see, uh, for example, when you look up to that great discovery that was made, I believe it was 2008, uh, when when we go back and we see the discovery of the Denisovans uh, that that we found uh, in in a cave that we find that the Denisovan DNA that started spreading uh, and again when we look at Neanderthals and uh, Denisovans we know that they are now you know extinct for the most part but I mean we have mix and match of like let's say you have uh, some Denisovan DNA in certain people or certain characteristics, uh, especially with everyone doing these DNA tests now. But the Denisovan qualities uh, that we start finding are, let's say, the people that live in Tibet. They can live at high altitudes because they have some Denisovan DNA and the, and the various Asiatic peoples that it spread out. Uh, and these were incredibly crafty people that could make uh, all kinds of tools and uh, they were taller uh, in their depictions but also Denisovan DNA is found over in some of our Native American populations and we start to find that you know maybe that's how it crossed over during the Bering Land Bridge but what's really fascinating is that we have this incredible story on earth and um, I know this is a huge topic and I might not be able to cover it all at the moment but we know that probably around 12,000 years ago, Grant, you've probably heard this before, that there was a great cataclysm that took place on Earth. And, I mean, we hear, we find this in the story of Egypt. We find okay. this with the Atlantis story. We know there are flood records in the Hindu, uh, in the Chinese, uh, over in, even in the biblical texts. Uh, we know that there was this, this great, these great events that took place on Earth. And actually, if you go back into Emmanuel Velikloski's work, we find that you know, there's several chapters dedicated to this topic when we look at worlds in collision and whatnot, that in the Arctic Circle and closer up to the North Pole and the north sides of the the North Pole sides of the planet, we find that there is tropical flora and fauna that was flash frozen in mammals. Uh, so the, the North Pole and the, the South Pole and Antarctica and all those areas were much different places. And the most interesting thing is, is that when I've been in places like Egypt with Brian Forrester, we have gone into these uh, areas where the temples are. And when you go to the temples, all the temple entrances, which should be aligned up with the cardinal directions of northeast, south, and west, they're all off by about 23 degrees, where we can see during a cataclysmic event, whether it was asteroids that hit the earth, um, solar storms, which it's most likely a combination of all of the above, the earth was thrown off its axile uh, you know, rotation are by 23 degrees. So all these entrances are about 23 degrees off, which I think is absolutely fascinating. Now, where this gets into the topic of what you asked is that in the ancient writings, uh, let's say we go back into Herodotus's work on the Hyperboreans, we learn about a migration of the people that came down from the north. 
And when they came down from the north, uh, we have all sorts of interesting stories that then we start connecting into northern India. Uh, and we go back into the Vedas and we go back into the Brahma and the, the, uh, the story that we get there is that they come down, uh, the, the Aryan people, for example, we were told, came down into the Indo-Gangenic Plains, or the Indo-Ganges, and mixed with the Dravidian people. And it's we get this fascinating story there that perhaps, as we go deeper into this, that they had flying machines. They had all kinds, there was advanced civilizations moving into these areas and spreading out into uh, other areas of Asia Minor and into Egypt and all these sort of places. So we have a very, very ancient story here of, of different types of humans that have been here. And I think that's where we start to connect into this idea of there being giants. Uh, because uh, really quickly, I just want to say one more thing on this. Uh, when you talk about other types of species, I've been in the Cairo Museum, Grant. Uh -huh. And when you're in the Cairo Museum, there's 15 to 25 foot sarcophagi that are cool. in there. And, yeah, cool. and it, yeah, it says enormous coffin. Or you're going into certain places like Hatur's Temple in Dandara. And you see giants ruling over smaller humans. So there's a, there's a different story there. Are we making any headway like on DNA? What's the best evidence you can cite for DNA? Because you know how it goes like with the, the Atacama. It's like, oh, no, no, it's human, human. You know, it's like human DNA. So what can you cite for DNA, the best evidence you think that there is that actually says there's something wrong here? This, this does not appear to be human. Well, it's very interesting because Brian Forrester... He's been working at this for years, uh, looking at the, the different DNA we find on what, what's been known as the elongated skulls. And what, what I want to say about this, uh, there, there's so much there's so much there about these elongated skulls because many people want to say, oh, OK, these are just, you know, forms of humans, other types of humans. And why would this be related to ETs? You know, why would there be, you know, anything there to look at? Well, first of all. If you go back into Egyptian mythology, we know that Plutarch said that these were the antediluvian, which of course means pre-cataclysmic or pre-flood, kings who were deified or made into gods after death. So who, who was Osiris in Egyptian mythology? Well, he was a god with an elongated skull uh, that we see that was a giant. Okay, so we have this giant with an elongated skull. Same with the idea of uh, Dagon or Oannes or Nimrod that is in Babylonian or Chaldean lore. So there we have that connection there. So we have these beings that were very important on Earth. They were very advanced, uh, uh, very advanced type of civilization. And so uh, over time, people tried to mimic them or copied them as like this ruling class that was very, very advanced. Uh, we know there was lots of head binding. There was lots of imitations and cranial deformation that was going on. Even Akhenaten, the, the famous Egyptian king uh, who left for Armana that we find in the, in the Egyptian stories. If you go to the Cairo Museum, you'll find that the depictions are of him and his family, that they're all portrayed with these elongated skulls. But we know that when we look at Amenhotep III or Tutankhamun, that we know they have regular skulls. Maybe they're a little bit elongated, but not, you know, not in the sense that we find in the depictions. So it's interesting that when we go and find, when we go and look further for this evidence, um, especially when we look over uh, from the other, like the really great elongated skulls that have been found over by the Caspian Sea, Northern Black Sea, Crimea, Scandinavian, Himalayan areas. Again, and there's a, a fascinating connection there. We find that this is this is similar in the genetic evidence that we find to what Brian's found with the large caches uh, over in Paracas in Peru. And my God, there's so much evidence there. Uh, so many other interesting clues. Well, Brian found, you know, Brian's been pushing for this DNA testing for years. Uh, and he's been looking at these different types of skulls and specimens over there. And what he did is that he needed to get together the right amount of money to get this genetic evidence uh, testing done for a long time. So he finally secured about $100,000 U.S., needed to do the testing, wow. and that was actually contributed by uh, L.A. Marzulli and his people, wow. and they went in there and they did this this testing on the skulls, and the, the most interesting thing about this is that they found that these skulls, that these elongated skulls they found were 25% larger and 60% heavier than a regular human skull, and the place where the spine would sit is is different. It would It's like a natural 
area that would support the weight of the head, ruling out all cranial deformation. So they were really shocked when the testing came back and they said, okay, this is Homo sapiens sapiens paracus, a totally different subspecies of human being, probably like a, a like a genetic offspring that we're seeing of whoever our um, visitors were, or whoever this great civilization that was here. So the interesting thing is, is that not only would these uh, beings would have had a reddish to blonde hair uh, and, and be in a totally different haplogroup, which is UTE1, but this causes a great problem there, Grant, for the, you know, the regular narrative that we find, especially when we see the, the Inca and other groups that are in other areas there, because um, Native Americans and others that would have crossed the the Bering Land Bridge, like um, hypothetically, uh, they would have come from different haplogroups like A, B, C, D, and and even X. So we have a different story now that's that's challenging academia, and this is very exciting because. I mean, there's so many references we have to these elongated skull beans and ideas of giants and strange, strange stories, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, let, let's go to alien DNA. Do you think it's all pemspermia or do you think that DNA is throughout the universe? I think DNA is throughout the universe. It, it's a little bit of both. Uh, you know, there's most certainly there's a, a blueprint in everything. If you don't mind, I just have a, a little bit of a, a story. I'll keep it really short yeah, about this sure, one. Sure, sure, yeah. So I'm a big fan of of John Muir, and I, I read a lot of John Muir's books, especially when I'm taking hikes, and I love spending time in nature, Grant. Uh, yeah. So I go out there and I read his books, and there's a passageway that always haunted me for years by John Muir, and it said, if you want to go into the universe, the clearest way is through a forest wilderness. So I always used to think, is there a doorway out in the forest so I can get out into the universe somewhere? And so, again, here's another story when I was in Egypt. I was over in, you know, the uh, visiting the Temple of Isis on the island of Philae in the Aswan. And I was walking uh, just, just with Stephen Mailer and I were walking, having a conversation. He goes, Johnny, come here. I want to show you something. And he pulls me off into the side area. And we go look up on the wall. And he says, look, this is where my teacher, the great Abdel Hakim Ayawan, would show me where, how to read the hieroglyphics. And we look up on the wall and it says, the power of the netters. And, and the netters is, are associated with the gods, but that's also where we get the word nature from, uh, which is from the Greek thesis and the Latin natura. Uh, the power of the netters comes from the cosmic out in space. And all of a sudden, the light bulb went on. Because when I think of the plasma electric universe theory and how right. everything is, is connected, all our stars are connected through a plasmic web. And we have stuff like the, the morphogenic field having the building blocks for all life on Earth and these instructions, Grant. Right. I, I started realizing that what astrobiologists say about you know how we probably have similar material on our planet to other solar systems, that we're all connected, that there's this, this great blueprint uh, that the grand architect has put out there in the universe. So I, I think it's it's beautiful that there's this, uh, you know, this kind of uh, this build, the building blocks are everywhere in the universe. Yeah. So you would agree with me uh, in a way that I say it's not random. It's it's pattern. It's like Rupert Sheldrake. Life uh, life creates the universe. Uh, it's all following a pattern. Life is learning rather than this idea that, you know, it's all random accident. It was just, you know, a bunch of things banging into each other. <laughs> yeah, I would agree with you, and I would definitely agree with Rupert Sheldrake. I'm a big fan of Sheldrake. Yeah, yeah, he's done a lot of uh, a lot of good work, and 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 he's a sort of a high profile person that that uh, they have to actually listen to. Absolutely, you're doing a, you're, Johnny, you're doing a fantastic job on my test here. You you're as smart as I thought you were. So, well, <laughs> you're let, you're let too kind, to, Grant. You're too kind. Well, let me go. You talked about reading, and I saw you with a book. I've had three big events in my life. Uh, one was my sighting. One was the download experience in 2012. The third one was I was at a lecture, didn't want to go to it, with Dr. Michael Newton. I saw you with Michael Newton's book. I know you do regressions. So explain to people who Dr. Michael Newton is and why he's so important. Oh, my goodness. I, I love Dr. Michael Newton. Do doctor, I'm so glad you brought him up. Thank you, Grant. Dr. Michael, Gruden, Dr. Michael Newton was a Ph.D. behavioral psychologist. He was an atheist. He was a skeptic. He didn't believe in any of these spiritual concepts, past lives, any of that stuff. And all of a sudden, one day, he gets a patient and uh, that, you know, they're asking about a psychosomatic pain that they're having in their leg. 
and they can't figure out where it's from. And so, of course, he was using a type of Ericksonian clinical hypnotherapy. He regresses them, and long story short, finds out that this person has the memory of injuring this their leg um, due to a, a battlefield or an incident that would have happened not in this lifetime. Of course, being a very logical person and also an amateur historian, you know, he was very skeptical. Uh, but of course, the information, you know, stood stood up against all his tests. And it was amazing how he was able to validate it. And as he went back and, and remedied this, he starts discovering that that we all have memories of not only our past lives, but what it's like to die and that we pick our bodies and you know where we where we come from and i think it's absolutely fascinating and there's other people that have done work like this in the, the realm of past life memories, uh, such as uh, Dr. Jim Tucker over at the University of Virginia has worked with children with past lives. And that, that's been going on for a long time at the University of Virginia. Absolutely fascinating for people to look up. Uh, and as you probably know, Grant, there's people like uh, Dolores uh, that have been yes. out there. Dolores Cannon yes. who have done this work as well. Yeah. Uh, so let, let's go through your background because so we don't miss this. You do. Uh, Michael Newton regressions, you do the, it's a very long regression, right? It's like four hours or whatever. It's not a, a short regression. You do that. Can you talk about, uh, you do this in, in Vancouver as a, as yes, a career? To be, well, to be perfectly honest with you, I was doing it more a few years ago, this sort of work. And I, I've always been fascinated with the mind. I, uh, I have a background with psychology counseling as well as working in the field of clinical hypnotherapy. And it's always fascinated me. This work, like you mentioned, is these sessions are four to five hours long, very exhausting. And that's the one thing why I don't do them as often anymore, because they are they take a lot out of you and you have to be very on point, like you're at the edge of your seat. But they are the most fascinating and the most rewarding uh, things I've done. And do we have time that I could quickly explain sure. how the process works? Oh, yeah, because this is this is what I say. This is the, one of the three big events in my life. When I saw how this all fit together, uh, it just changed my life. I mean, it was unbelievable. So it's very important. Sure, go away there. Oh, absolutely. And, and that's amazing. Now, what, when we're talking right now, uh, you know, and, and I, I just want to point this out that a lot of people think that hypnosis means that you're going to sleep and that, you know, you're out of it, you're out of your mind uh, with the word hypno and relating to sleep. But actually, it's a heightened state of awareness. So when we're talking right now, our brain waves are oscillating at beta mode or hyper beta mode. So yeah. when you're reading a book, or you're, you're watching television and you're just kind of lightly relaxed. You're going into a light alpha state. And that's why, it, you know, you're watching a television program or something. And I don't watch, I don't really watch TV, but this is for anyone who ever does out there. You're watching a TV show and someone says something to you and they said, did you take the garbage out? And you go, huh? You know, you didn't really hear them because you were watching the TV or reading your book. So that's an alpha state. And then when you start to lightly go a little further, you go into your theta and at your deepest, most profound level of sleep, that is your delta state. Now, the, the most interesting thing about that is that, just to give you some perspective, is that when you're a small child, you know, zero to four years old uh, or, or so, you're going in, you're in that delta state all the time. And as you get older and start moving up, you're going up into your thetas, uh, then you're uh, fluctuating into your alphas and betas and all the states through your teenage years. Now, what what's very interesting about this is that, as you know, there's different levels of the mind. Uh, you know, we have the conscious mind, which is your rational mind, your willpower, all that great stuff. You have your subconscious mind where your emotions, your habits, uh, permanent memories are stored. And then deep, deep, deep in your unconscious mind, you have your immune system, your automatic body functions. And that would be where we would say, OK, past life memories are somewhere in that subconscious mind. We have the critical factor uh, coming into the picture. Now, when you're dealing with just regular uh, hypnosis, you know, you, there's all sorts of reasons you might want to hypnotize yourself or work with hypnosis, but maybe you might want to overcome something that, you know, a bad habit uh, or, or somewhere in that area. We would we would delve into the subconscious mind. But when we're doing these uh, deeper states of hypnosis, we sometimes have to go very deep uh, to go into, let's say, a deeper alpha state to start getting past life memories, uh, going into, you know, a light theta to go get 
into your life between life memories. And the most amazing thing for me was when I started doing this work, it, it, it was never boring, I tell you. When you're sitting in front of somebody and you're doing one of these type of life between life protocols that Dr. Michael Newton lays out, it's incredible that you get a person that might be a skeptic in front of you and they're yeah. laying there or, or sitting in the chair and they're relating what they're seeing to you and how they picked their body, how they died and who the people in their lives are. And, and they're they're crying and moving their hands in front of you like they can see people and their spirit guide or our helpers are communicating through them. It's fascinating. But Grant, I took it a step further because I've always been fascinated, just like yourself, with ET contactees and abductees. Oh, wow. And I've done cases with people that have had, you know, these ET con uh, contactee experiments and the, the wealth of information and the richness of the information that came back from their lost time and memories they couldn't recall and the descriptions of these places were phenomenal. Wow. Yeah, and so you've got, and, and the other thing that we can bring up is that when you do it, you have like these soul groups. So you yes. will link up who all these people are. So in terms of the experiencers, and we probably not even gonna have time to talk about experiencers today. So I'll have to do another show. But um, in terms of experiencers, is there, have you seen the connection where a person's coming in to volunteer to be an experiencer that you and the experiencer or a number of us, you and I, and a bunch of people may actually have had a meeting before we were born and decided we were going to do this thing that people are linked together that way. That's exactly how it works. It's my experience, Grant. I'm sure that due to, based on how you're asking me the question, I know that you already know the answer to this because yeah. it's my theory that uh, in every question we already have the answer could turn the question mark into an explanation mark. But you know, when you're when you're dealing with people in these cases, they have already had this as part of their life plan. They have already had an agreement to see a UFO or they've already had an agreement to see this. This is these are these are sort of little, um, you know, road signs along the way or or things that have gone uh, gone to come together. And as a spiritual person that has talked to people, it is my belief that the uh, higher part of ourself already has an agreement in place if we're going to interface with extraterrestrials that we already know that, that that we can handle this that this is an important part of our life who what we're supposed to do so i think it's a very beautiful uh experience that has so many vast implications yeah i hope we can work on this uh, in terms of putting the data out because that that basically changes the whole scenario because basically you have you know these evil aliens are coming and they're taking people against their will and if you get into multiple lives or you get into these soul agreements then there really are no abductions there are just people who have to take personal responsibility for the situation they're in and say why did i choose to do this what is my role on 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 the earth i couldn't i i couldn't agree with you more i was recently I, I, I guess I shouldn't go there on this topic, but I was recently <laughs> invited out to a documentary that was more faith based and it just yeah. came out on uh, extraterrestrials and uh, it, it, ETs, uh, abductions and whatnot. It was a movie called The Alien Intrusion. And I got to say that that was the kind of the premise to the entire documentary. I, I, honestly, I was cringing through it. Uh, <laughs> and it was they were talking about how these were these were very evil and terrible experiences. And, uh, you know, they were most certainly coming from a malevolent place. And I, I, I disagree with that strongly. I think that these experiences are misunderstood. And of one day, we will understand them more from a, a greater perspective. And I, I love I love the way you came at this with that. Yeah, you you dealt with my assistant Desta and she does um, Dolores Cannon regressions. And wow. both her and both her and I say the same thing. Like we can't be regressed. So this is always a, a deal. So you're doing uh, regressions. Uh, what percentage of people can be regressed, and what what is this whole story that some people can't be regressed? Is that true, or what's actually going on there? I've heard a lot of people say that. I've heard a lot of people say that that they can't be regressed. I disagree with that hypothesis. I just think that there's a, a person such as yourself and Desta, I would rate you, Grant, as a highly, highly analytical person. You yeah. uh, you have a fascinating and brilliant mind, and I hope you don't mind me saying that, but I mean, I've read your work, uh, you know, I've, I've listened to you, I know how your mind works, and your mind is working on like 10 different levels above the regular conversation. So, as is yours. <laughs> well, thank you kindly, but for someone like yourself, 
and, and I mean every word of this, for someone like yourself, everything I'm telling you, you're analyzing it on like 10 different levels. And that's why your investigations are so damn good. But the, the reason is, is that when someone's hypnotizing you, uh, there's a process here. First of all, when you sit down in the chair, the hypnosis has already begun. And when you sit in the chair, the hypnotist is establishing a rapport with you. And the rapport is, you know, they're trying to find similarities to you and you guys are laughing about the same things. They're paying very close attention to what you're saying because they're listening for the words that you're using. If you're a guy that's saying things like, well, I see what you're saying or imagine what you're saying, they're putting a V down on the page. And the V stands yeah. for you're a visual person. If you're saying, well, I, I feel you, Johnny, I feel what you're saying or that doesn't feel right to me they're putting a k for kinesthetic if you tell me that you hear what i'm telling you and that sounds good i'm putting an a for auditorial so these are going to tell me what induction words that i need to use so based on how good the clinical hypnotherapist is when they're giving you your inductions they are going to be firing words off and, and they're going to be firing things off that are saying, well, you feel yourself going down these stairs or you see the stairs or you hear the steps if you follow me. And they're yeah. going to be working with you to customize those words and firing the suggestions. The other thing is, Grant, uh, why it doesn't work for some people is that some people just uh, aren't like some practitioners aren't watching the, the the client. They're not watching their physiological responses. They're not seeing, are, are, is their skin changing? Is their eye, are, is there, are their eyes moving? There's certain, there's certain giveaways signs when you know a person is going deeper and deeper into the right state. Because if they're not into the right state, it's pretty much useless. And after the person will go, oh, it was a complete failure. It didn't work. My take on it is that, yes, it does work. Everyone can be hypnotized. It's just you got to know the right way to, to come at it. You know, you know what I mean? Wow. So, so you, you really don't do this that much, but if I, or one of my listeners need a Newton regression, which I would say is probably the most dramatic thing that will ever awaken you to what's actually going on. Would you still, would you still do it in Vancouver? Are you still I would, I would, people. I would, I would consider it again in the future when, uh, especially if someone really wanted it, uh, especially when the time slots open up. The problem I have at the moment is I've had so many different projects going on that I've been working yeah. on where the 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 takeoff, the four to five to six hours to do these things yeah. at a time oh, yeah. in multiple sessions is very time consuming. But I'll tell you, there's people out there that I consider to be very, very good at this, and uh, there are other people in this area, especially that do it. But th there are some remarkable people that have taken off at this uh, doing clinical hypnotherapy. And it, the point is, is that when you meet somebody that does it, it's important that you feel good with it, that it has to resonate with you when you, you talk to the practitioner. If you have any apprehension with the practitioner, you're going to put a guard up. You're, you're going to put, you know, um, you're going to put a block up. You're going to be blocking their words. You have to feel comfortable with them to go further into the experience and kind of let go, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So, so let's get into some of the projects you do do now. Um, you're doing tours of Egypt. Can you talk about the different tours you do in case somebody wants to come and maybe give your website or your, your contact stuff so people can contact you? Absolutely. I appreciate you bringing that up uh, very, very much. So the, the tour to Egypt that I'm doing is next year, next March. And that will be up on the website, Ancient Mystery, uh, Ancient Mystery Tours. Uh, and it's going to be with Muhammad Ibrahim, ancientmysterytours.com. And we're going to be going into all the ancient temples. Uh, Muhammad is uh, an incredible Egyptologist. You know, he's worked with the very best, even Zai Was, uh, who is a very controversial figure nonetheless. But uh, Muhammad is incredible with reading hieroglyphics. So he's going to be giving lectures on our tour about how you can read hieroglyphics, which are absolutely fascinating. You learn tricks on how to read them in every direction, depending on which way they're pointing. You know, we're going to be exploring, you know, all sorts of stuff like the Hiram Key and, and great mysteries that you're not going to get on other tours, going deeper into the symbolism in the temples more than than ever. We're going to be going inside the Great Pyramid and spending a considerable amount of time. And we're going to have some other surprises that people don't get in other places that you that Muhammad gets very special permissions to do, uh, that we might just be going under the Giza Plateau or underneath uh, special areas in Alexandria. Uh, as for in Peru and Bolivia and Paracas and all this, uh, come join us with Brian Forrester. And again, we're going to be exploring ideas with the Serpentine Mysteries. And uh, the, when I say Serpentine Mysteries, Mysteries, my goodness, I have a lot to talk about with this. 
And I'll be bringing it up at our upcoming conference as well, because when we talk about that subject, the the serpent is greatly misunderstood. It is, and and I could I could go on forever on this, but it's connected to you know Tesla's energy, scalar energy. It's connected to, uh, in my opinion, wireless free energy or zero point, and it is so important to all the ancient civilizations. Uh, even in the Yucatan, uh, we find. Uh, with uh, Quetzalcoatl and Kukulakan, to in Egypt, to in Peru, we have Viracocha, which is talking about the energy ley lines of the earth that all of our temples are built alongside, but also Amaru, which America is named after, Amaruka, land of the plume serpent. So these mysteries are great as well as the elongated skulls. So uh, that can you can find information about our tour there next November at hiddenincatours.com. Wow, fascinating stuff. I, ho- I hope people uh, join you on it because it's, uh, I've known people who, who have followed that kind of stuff, and it's, it's getting big now with, uh, I think Von Donneken's coming out with another book, yes. and there's a lot of people that are, that are it's, it's a big topic, so I hope people will follow up on that. Now, before we um, run out of time here, I, you talked about a word, and I'm writing a book on it. What do you know about portals? Portals. Okay. Absolutely fascinating. And I I can't wait to see your book on this. I I hope that I can get an autographed copy when it comes out. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, I'm actually working. It came out of the the Mission Rama. Have you dealt with Mission Rama out of Peru? That's where I sort of got um, sort of dragged into one of their events and something happened and I sort of drank the Kool-Aid and I was just absolutely fascinated with, they they call them Zendras. But so... um, have you dealt with Mission Rama and have you, how do, what's your story of, of portals? Okay, well, I haven't done a lot of research uh, in that area of Peru and I'm fascinated to learn about that. So most certainly I, I can't wait to, to, to see yeah. your work on that. Uh, but with portals, absolutely, we have all sorts of mentionings of them all over the place. And, and as we were just talking about the serpent and the serpentine energy, which, uh, again, I would like to go back, uh, or, or sorry, I'm going to go back into this when we get into the conference and, and when everyone's there. I want to talk about how that was the ancient movement in our universe that we see that energy was moving in called Fohat. And Blavatsky and others were talking about this. But when you go back into Egypt, you know, we've heard we've heard about a wormhole grant. But in Egypt, they called it a serpent hole. And I was just talking to Muhammad Ibrahim about this, about portals and what the Egyptians believed about this. And Brian and I have been to various areas around Egypt where it's been said, okay, we have stargates um, and different talks about, you know, where what these could have been and where they lead to and uh, the idea of where they are in the universe. And, of course, you brought up earlier the fairies. Well, we'll look at the idea of uh, fairy rings. Uh, We have fairy rings, we have crop circles, we have stuff like when you look at Stonehenge, Stonehenge, and then Avebury, there are 900 megalithic henges that go all the way up the British Isles and lead all the way up the Napta Playa in Egypt. And they're all moving alongside the the path of the, the energy grids on our planet, which the ancients have known about for a very long time. And uh, I know this is a little off topic, but I'll bring it back, I promise. Yeah. But when we look over at where all the great destructions on this Earth happened during the cataclysm, why did the, the solar storms that hit the Earth, why did they follow along all of these energy paths and destroy all the temples? Like uh, something just came through and burnt them to a crisp and, and threw blocks all over the place. So they knew that there was some kind of an energy portal. And when you go to a, what do you do when you go to a healing place? You go to a yeah. healing circle. When you want to do uh, magic or work with all sorts of beings, which, by the way, I think is an ancient phone system, um, you know, that people are using. They're going into a circle. So these portals and ideas of, of, ener- of time and space being bent, warped and twisted into that circuitous pattern um, – it's incredible, and so that's why I think it's a very real and important topic. What do you what do you think a portal actually is? Is it going to another place? Is it got to do with uh, time and space being bent, or um, what do you think is actually going on? Well, I, again, that's a that's a good way of looking at that. We're bending time and space. Uh, I was listening to Dr. Michio Kaku do a lecture about it, actually, and he was talking about how you know the the future possibilities of us creating a portal to go into another universe, for example. And he said, what we would do is we would use a powerful laser 
to to rip open a tear the fabric of space time and then inject you know nanobots or uh, into the into there to expand it and then we would reconfigure it somewhere else so there's like a uh, a multi-dimensional functionality in it and i guess that's where we could also start looking at certain types of of space travel but uh and then we start looking at ideas of of black holes and and everything else that we could have different wormholes and other kind of configurations so i i think that there there's all sorts of incredible implications uh not only philosophically scientifically and otherwise but uh, i would say grant that we also have sort of mentionings of them in our mythologies and in other other writings but what have you found um well that's what i i two years ago i would have thought this is total nonsense until i yes. I, I got dragged into this <laughs> and then uh, they talked about opening these uh they called them zendras and people going into these things exactly uh you know seven at a time and this 10 foot being standing there and i'm interviewing these people one after another and saying what did you see oh this is 10 foot being standing there what did you see oh so there's 10 foot being and i'm going like i can't believe this you know like the the sort of the uh smoke uh, bluish fog forms and and then they go inside this bluish fog and this happens and i was just floored by this i thought you know like sort of like I've worked on consciousness, which would be my next question. I've worked on consciousness. And to me, it was like, if this is true, if there are portals, then the nuts and bolts idea of the universe is in a lot of trouble. And yes, absolutely. And, and you so know what, what do you think of the role of consciousness is? Well, first of all, I think consciousness is a non-local awareness. So um, most certainly, you know, consciousness plays an incredible, uh, an incredible part in this. And as, and I'm sure that you've looked at the the different works of uh, Orc Orr uh, when you look over at Penrose's work and, and Professor Stuart Hameroff, where they've looked yeah. over at quantum consciousness and how it it works in the brain. Uh, you know, we have entanglement and superpositioning and all kinds of ideas that come into play there. But um, most certainly in Egypt too, when you go into the temples there. And we find a similarity, I guess, in Peru and all these other places, um, and even, I guess, in our modern uh, doorways and sort of our um, our, our infrastructure or our architectonics, we find that there's these three levels of the triptych arches. Well, in the Holy of Holies and in the temples with the netters in, in Egypt, there is like this portal, this doorway that looks like it's designed to go into another place, another dimension. And I've often thought when I've sat, I've sat in these temples and I looked over it, I said, I wonder if there was some kind of technology or device that might have been there at one point. Uh, or a stone that came from space that gave it some kind of energy in these places that when you came there, that there was some sort of way to have the the other beings come forward or, or you leave there to go somewhere else. And, and could this technology and, and whatnot have been removed or could it have been, you know, placed somewhere else? So. I think consciousness plays a fascinating role in this. It's very, very important. We're only beginning to understand it. We we know it has multiple layers to it. Uh, we also know that we work within frequencies. Uh, and and you might have a being come in from a different consciousness that is uh, like a neutrino light source that's brushing up against the fabric of space-time or being able to change the harmonic resonance of something in a room. I think it's incredible. Uh, so I'm yeah. very excited to see your work. Yeah, well, I, and you worked. Uh, you worked on so many fields that I was in. You you mentioned DMT ayahuasca. You know, you yes. know that the beings appear there. How, how does this fit into the UFO world? Because I, the way I sort of look at it, is that there's uh, it's all consciousness, and that you can link into these things. So whether you're interacting with beings that are out there, or in dreams, or in ayahuasca, there's it's just something outside our perception in the physical world. Absolutely. And and that's most certainly with DMT, dimethyltryptamine, and all the incredible studies that Dr. Rick Strassman has done. Uh, I love that he called it the spirit molecule. And for the longest time, people said, is this just a, you know, some sort of hopeless hypothesis that's floating around out there that DMT is created in the pineal gland along with serotonin when we wake up or melatonin when we go to bed. But then they found DMT in the pineal glands of rats. And we find that it's literally in, in everything. I think that it most certainly is the way the sort of the spiritual lubricant and the way that we start to uh, change you know, our perception and uh, and all these frequencies, we're only perceiving a very small narrow band of frequency around us that we're seeing in the visible spectrum with our eyes. So, uh, yeah, I think it's absolutely incredible. And I would agree with you 
uh, completely. I think that consciousness is where we need to look, and it sounds to me very much that that's where your work is gone, going. Sorry, and I think that's where Alton Grant. To be perfectly honest with you, I'm so happy to hear that that's where you're looking because I think that's where all of this needs to to be directed into the top, the subject of consciousness, um, being kinder and lo- uh, being more loving and being in harmony with our earth, being the great caretakers, taking responsibility for ourselves. I think that's what this information shows us and where we're going, and I'm excited about that. Yeah. So let's go to your how it starts for you. You have a, a you and your sister, I believe, have some experiences that sort of are outside the physical realm. So can you explain what happened there? How you yeah, got dragged no. into this? Absolutely. So when I was growing up, I had strange experiences around the house. My sister was reporting a uh, a being that, you know, she was shocked. There's a being looking in her window. And uh, the being was your typical gray extraterrestrial is looking into her window. And uh, my, I was having strange experiences, too. My, my mom, who's a very religious person, even to this day, doesn't like talking about these things too much at all. And she reluctantly very reluctantly admit she says both of you were saying you had these gray little gray men coming into your rooms at night and and she just you know figures that they're some sort of fallen as a religious person says oh it's some kind of fallen spirit or something like that but she said there was a lot of activity around the house and she herself was showing what they look like and glimpses of this sort of a ship and she doesn't like talking about it whatsoever but i was having around that time all sorts of out of body experiences in and being in other places in the backdrop of space i'll never forget them uh it's it's incredible um and and so growing up you know i didn't have a lot of answers and so uh, there was sort of an information embargo go about this stuff where I wasn't allowed to look it up. So when other kids, I like to joke about this, when other kids were my age, uh, boys my age were hiding playboys under their bed, I was hiding, you know, metaphysical books and crystals and stuff like that under my bed. And I was reading these things, anything I could get on it. And it never, the fascination never stopped looking for answers. And I, I've st- still, I got the thirst, you know, I'm constantly looking in every area uh, because these experiences are so remarkable and so just like you i've seen different things throughout my life uh and and whatnot that have just been like that you know it just keeps keeps you going down the rabbit hole and it just keeps getting weirder the deeper you go and it's wonderful so you've had you've had a a lot of experience from young in working on this a lot of people sort of want to know what the ultimate answer is like uh what happens when we die what's the best evidence for survival you've seen in all your research for what happens after we die. That's one of my favorite, favorite subjects. As you know, I I love that subject. And I I constantly am looking for people to interview on that. Uh, One of my favorite people in the whole world. I love him so much. I've been been over to his place and talked to him is Daniel Brinkley. I love his story. And uh, there's a fellow Ozark publishing uh, on your on your publishing label. Uh, There's a wonderful, wonderful guy named uh, Garnet Schulhauser. And I've talked to him quite a bit about his experiences. I know you guys are both on Ozark. Ozark. Um, I think he's got some great evidence, uh, uh, or not, sorry, some great um, information about what happens after we die and where we go. But as for evidence, I would point people back to the studies done by uh, uh, Penrose and uh, also uh, over by Hameroff. Uh, Penrose, of course, being the famed British physicist, and Hameroff over at the University of Arizona being an anesthesiologist. They have looked, again, at the orc or the quantum consciousness theory on the brain. And uh, there's so much information coming out all the time. Uh, we had even Alexander's work, uh, you know, people people looking at this subject from not only the empirical side, but I think what people should be looking at outside of the empirical even. And my goodness, there's, there's such a huge amount of uh, data now that I can see that goes way back about people talking about this through our religions and histories. But there's so there's so much evidence that you can find what, by what people are saying that they learn from these experiences. Look who they used to be and who they came back as. What yeah. they're saying, I think that is the most remarkable evidence to me that, that near-death experiences are real. Wow. Another thing that uh, research you've done uh, that crosses over with mine, I wrote a book called Inspired, and I heard you in one interview talking about uh, people getting – a number of people all getting the same invention at the same time. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. And um, 
uh, most certainly there's a cosmic record in the universe. And as you know, that the word inspired comes from inspirited to be inspirited. So when you're going, hey, I'm inspired. Well, there's a reason you're inspired. There's a reason you have that excitement and something's come to you. Uh, when we look at people like Walter Russell and uh, being able to have, you know, just the abilities to sculpt something for no for no reason, just be able to uh, have the incredible abilities to have scientific formulas come to them. Uh, Nikola Tesla said there is a uh, a core in the universe. I don't know how it works, but I know it exists because my brain is only a receiver. Um, you have people like Rudolf Steiner who who wrote all these books and gave over 6,000 lectures on tapping into this cosmic field, uh, which he called anthroposophy. Uh, this human science where he taught people and people are still using Steiner's work today to be able to enhance agriculture, medicine, science, uh, everything out there by tapping into the cosmic field, the cosmic record of information. And uh, this is very much what Madame Blavatsky was doing. Blavatsky was, you know, such a fascinating woman. And I, and I, I, I will try to make this short because I could go off forever about her, but she, I think she was just one of the truest feminists that there was, um, really incredible she travels all over the ancient uh, all the parts of the world looking at the ancient mysteries dressed like a man uh with not a penny to her name just just earning uh living through creative ways and she was tapping into a cosmic field of information in the universe using her intuition at the same time she was an encyclopedist uh, encyclopedist looking up all these strange mysteries so um there there's so much that we can learn by tapping into that field to get inspired or or inspirited if we want to use it for consciousness sake. Wow. I've still got 20 questions left and we're almost out of time. So let me sort of remind people, uh, you and I, and I, I'm going to want to buy you lunch because I want to pick your brain again in Vancouver. Oh. <laughs> uh, we're going to be at the Architects of the New Paradigm, uh, June the 30th. Uh, Vancouver, absolutely beautiful place for anybody who hasn't been there. And go again through your details, of what you're up to, and then we'll shut her down. Okay, well, thank you so much, Grant. Yeah, absolutely. Please join us at the Architects of the New Paradigm Conference. It's going to be fantastic. We're going to have a great time. Uh, uh, I, I got to tell you, I'm excited to pick your brain, and I want to listen to your <laughs> lecture. I'm I'm a huge fan. Uh, well, the my website is www.metaphysicalsource.com. It's currently being updated. I have a YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash metaphysical source. You can find me on Facebook or find me on Twitter as Johnny Enoch. And I, I very much can't wait to meet you all there and to delve into these fascinating subjects together. So make sure you get your tickets today. Okay. Thank you, Johnny Enoch. And I'll turn, send it back to KGRA with this reminder. Uh, next week, I will be introducing my A-level Hollywood guy. He's coming forward. We're not going to use his name yet. It eventually will, will be out there. He's a full-blown experiencer. And although we're not going to use his name, he's connected to at least one of the most famous people in the United States, maybe even two people. Uh, he will tell how things started, uh, how, what he sees, the messages he gets, and the attempts he's making to film what's around him. And it all stop, starts here on KGRA next week on my show. Thanks. You've been listening to The Cameron Files with Grant Cameron. Any rebroadcast or duplication of this program or program content without express written permission from the KGRA DB is strictly prohibited. The Cameron Files in direct cooperation with the internet website presidentialufo.com.